Hi, I am Daniel Gaylar Chua, and for today, we will be discussing theorizing ability as capability in philosophy of education. This chapter traces capability as a topic of educational concern and ongoing debate, exploring what is meant by the philosophical concept of capability in the international lineage of education philosophy. Its purpose is first to clarify and situate the meaning of capability within historical and contemporary debates within educational philosophy, and second, to explore the relationship between specific philosophical accounts of capability and the notions of educational equality and social justice in education. The term capability is conceptually rich and linked to considerations of opportunity, ability, disability, agency, and freedom to be educationally capable is to have an educational opportunity, an educational ability, or an educational freedom. As I will discuss, capability can be distinguished from capacity, which tends to refer to an intrinsic state of bodies or mind rather than a learned or acquired state. Beyond its broad conceptual meaning, the term and concept of cap capability have been used by philosophers of education to refer to a specific theoretical framework for thinking about educational justice and equality. Usually called the capability or capability approaches or capability theory. This framework developed out of the work of Amartya Sen and Martha Musban and has recently garnered considerably attention within the field of educational philosophy. At the same time, the concept of capacity is understood more broadly in terms of the power or potential of individual students related to the interactions of their individual capacities with educational environments, access, and opportunities. Historical emergence of and changes in the topic as an educational concern. In a very basic way, capability or the power or potential to do something is the most fundamental concern of educators and educational theorists. Through schooling, students develop skills and abilities that enable them to pursue future educational career and life opportunities. Ability and capability are therefore linked as concepts through a complex relationships among individuals, bodies, and mind, and the schooling and social environment in which they develop. Whether a student develops the power to do something is dependent on a variety of factors, including their physical, cognitive, sensory, and psychological abilities at a given point in time, the resources available to them, the beliefs and attitudes of educators and society more broadly, and certainly the social arrangements of institutions. In the field of education, more generally, Ge global changes in the legal and policy approach to special education and disability services have begun, albeit often slowly to bring sustained attention to differences of ability or disability as a concept. It is not an overstatement that people understood as having disabilities have been ill-treated and largely forgotten by institutions of education and educational theorists for most of history. Throughout most of the 20th century, people labeled with disabilities in North America and elsewhere were warehoused in institutions historically referred to as training schools or asylums, which is very horrifying. This emphasis on separation finds its more recent extension in special education practices that segregate students labeled with disabilities from their presumed to be normal people, 
normal students, perhaps. Disability studies or DS scholars posit that disability is a complex social phenomenon and ontological experience and describe a variety of versions of what is called the social model of disability, working off and the distinction between the physic-based and medical approaches to disability. We partner field of disability studies in education, or DSE, likewise situates disability within social educational processes and paradigms. Most certainly, DSE scholars regard traditional special education and psychological diagnostic and treatment practices as not only detrimental to the educational growth and experiences of students identified as disabled or who differ in some way from what is described as the norm, but also as constructive of the phenomenon and concepts of disability itself, both DS and DSE seeks to disrupt the centrality of normalcy and the sorting mechanisms and hierarchy of society that rely on normalcy rather than being regarded as a deceit, disability is here seen as a difference that can be welcomed, incorporated, and even celebrated within the classroom. Alongside this growth of a field dedicated to the educational study of disability, the concept of disability in particular has historically been either ignored as a field of study by educational philosophers or treated as a straightforward concept having clear ethical implications for the field of education. The role of disability in education has only recently emerged as a more centralized concern within philosophy of education. Owing considerably to the increasingly influential work of DS and DSE scholars whom I discussed as well as changing international attitudes and legal policies surrounding special education. So for these scholars, some of the primary questions include um, what exactly is equity and equal educational opportunities for people who have or are perceived to have disabilities? What is owed to students with disabilities as a matter of justice? What educational arrangements best facilitate the learning of students with disability? So these questions are generated for the people who has disabilities or for special education. Other educational philosophers are similarly interested in questions of justice, but often work beyond and outside of traditional and analytical um, political philosophy and liberal theory. Some focus specifically on ontological and epistemological questions surrounding ability and disability. Okay? while others conceptualize the relationship among justice, equality, and the broader cultural, um, political, economic, and social forces of our, our particular historical era. Significant, significant questions include how do disabled subjects emerge through historical moments and technologies? How do transnational economic and political processes such as capitalism, colonialism, and racism, transnational migration work to produce this disability and disabled subjects? How does the field of traditional special education reinforce positivity and, and deficit-based responses to disability? You know, there are a lot of questions concerning um, people with disability. As time changes, answers emerges from these questions, and by those answers, new questions are reborn. Making the innovation for the improvement of capability in the philosophy of education stronger. Predominant approaches in philosophy of education. The concept of capability 
has tremendous international significance, both with respect to its philosophical or scholarly reach and with respect to the implications of that scholarship in international contexts. This is so whether one looks at literature considering capability as a broad conceptual matter and as a specific approach. Studying capability as a broad concept in educational philosophy requires being attentive to both the localized pecu peculiarities and tensions of a particular time and place and attending to the role of broad global forces that shape educational opportunities and experiences. The most sustained attention to capability in philosophy of education has been through work on the capability approach or the CA approach. Applications of CA to educational philosophy have not been confined to question of ability and disability specifically, and yet rich debates have emerged from, let's say, dialogues around ability and disability in, the, in that field. And the framework has clear implications for many of the questions raised by scholars of disability studies and offers interesting points of overlap. As a framework for evaluating justice, um, CA emerged as a response to a perceived limitations in liberal philosophical um, work on justice, notably the work of John Rawls. According to Amatresen in 1979, Rawls' account of the egalitarian distribution of resources um, in society neglected an important consideration of how individuals convert the resources they have into opportunities. That is, if neglected, that mere access to resources is insufficient to empower individuals to benefit from those resources. Applying this critique to the context of education, some educational philosophers have argued that the focus on capability more adequately illustrates educational objectives related to educational equality. Okay? Capability frameworks in their various forms have evolved philosophically and in their application to concrete education, educational and other problems. Okay? A number of philosoph philosophers have used um, CA in considering questions of educational justice for students with disabilities. In his Tanner Lectures in Human Values of 1979, um, entitled Equality of What? Sen argued that equality exists in space of capability or the power or freedom to pursue various beings and doings. Scholars of CA begin from the premise that equality is best measured with the reference to what individuals can actually do and be with the mater materials, resources to which they have access, and the freedom they have to achieve their valued ends or goals in life. Educational philosophers Ingrid Robbins in 2005 says that defines that CA is a broad normative framework for the evaluation and assessment of individual be well-being and social arrangements. The design of social policies and proposals about social change in society as an outcomes-based approach to equality and justice. CA is concerned with uh, whether means, um, material conditions, access, resources, financial or otherwise, educational conditions for etc. and etc. Et okay, are present to allow individuals to achieve their desired ends. This focus on ends originates in two important emphasis and underlying assumptions of the approach that human diversity is an empirical fact related 
or relevant to the needs persons have and to their ability to convert resources into advantage well-being. And that freedom, the ability to choose are central to human dignity. Regarding the first of these, when we acknowledge that humans have the diverse bodies, mental abilities, inhabit a variety of national, natural environments and social political contexts, um, central tenets of disability studies approaches certainly, we begin to see how this diverse might be relevant to human differences in the way that we use the resources available to us okay this ends based approach involves considering not simply the resources to which we have access um, and their quality and quantity but importantly the process through which one converts um, these resources both material and non-material into individual advantage a process we can call conversion Conversion capacity, okay? Conversion capacity. Conversion factors are broad and include one's personal characteristics, the physical condition, the intelligence, the metabolism, and etc. Okay? The environment one inhabits, um, climate, geographical location, architectural design, etc. And social conditions, for example, um, political of one's political community, for example, public policies, social norms, discriminating practices, power relations, and etc. Um, for example, a child with a physical disability who attends a well-resourced school might nevertheless face difficulty converting these into a valuable, valuable educational experience, whether because of the built environment within which they live because of teachers or peers attitudes of disrespect because of a lack of disability specific knowledge on the part of educational professionals or because of the child's own physical limitation so this has become a problem um, not only here in the philippines but all throughout the world because um, people who have disabilities are greatly misunderstood. Current and recurrent debates, global differences and value capabilities. Among the areas of ongoing tension and debate is whether a focus on capability can account for the existing range of cultural differences in civic and social values that exist globally that is how can capability theory be institutionalized and operationalized within local educational policy in a way that does not perpetuate imperial injustices this is of particular concept or concern as capability theory is aimed to inform and transform educational and human development contexts around the world in a move that has become a source of conflict between Amartyasen and Martha Nussbaum's version of capability approach. Amartyasen argues that capability approach identifies a relevant space for evaluating capability and functioning, but is silent on how these are to be weighted or ranked within that space. For Amartyasen, an indexing or weighting of capabilities is context-dependent. That is, it will vary by the particular cultural and social context in which evalu equality is being evaluated. Amartyasen is opposed, therefore, to a general or fixed forever listing or ranking of capabilities rather than to a list itself. Marcia Nussbaum, um, however, does present a list of capabilities and thus sees this list as a starting point for debate, revision, and importantly, specification of that capability relevant to a particular cultural or national context with the understanding that decisions about which capabilities are valued to be based in what she calls an intuitive idea of human dignity. 
She claims that Sam's refusal to list means that his capability theory lacks bite by an endorsing a list. This disagreement between Marchesen and Marcia Nussbaum encompasses a problem for the approach generally. It raises the problem of the appropriateness or usefulness of a list and it raises the indexing problem, which is essentially about capability rankings or weightings rele relative to one another. For Amartya Sen, this is a question for democratic decision-making. For Nussbaum, her 10 capabilities represent the bare social minimum for a, so for a just society and allow no trade-offs. Among the capabilities in her list, this is a society that that neglects one capability in the promotion of another is not a fully just society. One way to understand the difference between Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum's position is that they disagree not on listing as such, but rather on when to list. Okay, When Amartya Sen charges Nussbaum as undervaluating uh, undervaluing cultural context and freedom, Nussbaum questions whether a localized capabilities list can be developed without prior understanding of what uh, of what should be included. Okay, so now let us tackle individual versus structural. Another area of debate within capability theory surrounds the question of whether capability approach is too individualistic, focusing too much on individuals and not enough on social groups and social structures. This problem relates to the first as it connects with the question of how to avoid cultural imposition of values. Robbins suggests that this critique consists in variously three possible charges. So first, it is stated here that capability approach fails to see individuals as socially embedded and connected to others. Second claim says here that capability approach doesn't pay sufficient attention to groups. And last but not the least, capability approach doesn't pay sufficient attention to social structures. Robbins argues that the first charge is simply wrong. Wrong though siya, guys. Because capability approach is concerned with F Ethical individualism, that is, that the proper focus of moral concern is the individual, but not that only individuals exist, nor that individuals, as the proper focus of concern exists as disconnected from social groups and structures. Capability approach evaluates the equality of individuals as socially embedded. All versions of capability theory place a great deal of emphasis on capability as relational, that is, as promoted within relationships among individuals and between individuals and their environments. <coughs> Sovereign, Dinolin, and J. Alistair McGregor in 2010 offers a comprehensive argument regarding the role of social groups, social structures, and social meanings in CA. So, both of these philosophers um, gave an argument regarding the second and the third or the second and the third problem of capability approach. So, these authors argue that. Capability approach account of individual freedoms and individuals' well-being fails to sufficiently account for the way that differences in social power influences our social meanings, which is in turn affect the way that persons conceive of their own well-being and valued ends. They suggest that a vi viable capability approach that is one that could inform work in social policy and in practical applications to social matters would need to account for the ways that individual freedoms and individual well-beings are defined and realized constitute, constituted throughout relationship, relationships with others. 
in what I see as an important aspects of their argument. Dolan and McGregor consider the way that capability approach has dismissed the use of subjective assessments of quality of life or happiness in favor of objective assessments. Whether people have access to and freedom to access conditions that promote health, education, political participation, and so on. The relationship between capability and resources. An important area of connection surrounding um, capability theory in philosophy of education is the question of whether a focus on resources including opportunities and access of those resources or a focus on capability better attends to educational needs and educational contexts. These debates focus on two central questions. First, does the focus on capability underspecify the opportunities that are needed for educational flourishing? And second, does the focus on capability provide clear standards on how to approach questions of diversity that demand trade-offs in educational contexts? In their chapter of the edited volume Measuring Justice, Primary Goods and Capabilities in 2010, Harry Brighthouse and Elaine Unterhalter argue that the approach has much to contribute to thinking about educational policies and pedagogy, but ultimately claim that it requires the support of a Rawlsian framework of primary goods in order to guide reasoning about educational entitlements. According to these authors, justice would therefore require basic educational conditions adequate to the development and exercise of, of such educational results that require more specification than capability approach provides. In practice, educators and policymakers are constantly making decisions about what children should learn. And this means that learning trade-offs always occur in a, philosoph in a philosophical view of educational justice ought to provide guidance to these authorities. Consider the dilemma surrounding whether schools ought to provide to children from groups that face discrimination and education that provides them with the opportunities to participate in dominant social and economic frameworks. Even when these frameworks and the, educational, and the education to provide them for participation undermine their ability to participate in the shared cultural norms of their group. Brighthouse and Unterhalter use the example of Black Americans, but I think the example equally applies to deaf children and children of deaf parents. A standard is required to aid in making these decisions, and these authors see a Rosian informed view of educational entitlements as more adequately providing that standard. Another question that arises related to the question of resources versus capabilities is the role or impact that restriction to functioning that some students experience, notably students with disabilities, have on their educational experience. According to Thursey, expectations should not change. Children with functioning restrictions are still entitled to the same threshold level of functioning as other children. Okay, so how does that work? First, it means that provisions of additional resources for children with disabilities must allow them to develop the same functioning as are required of non-labeled children, but does not necessitate to the allocations of infinite resources to those with a significant disabilities. Capability approach presents a normative framework that considers individuals' particular well-being as relational. That is, there are instances in which balancing one's personal uh, needs and relations to others will involve setting a limit on the resources they receive. If the allocations of the resources to a child with a disability deprives others of the resources necessary for them to achieve levels of functioning to participate effectively in society, then it is unjustified. Further, because the question of distribution is one that governs not just what resources will be provided to students, educational materials, aids, assistive devices, etc., etc., but also the, the site in which education takes place, a framework of capability applied to the education of children with disabilities would need to be addressed the questions of whether inclusion in all cases is appropriate. Inevitably, then, capability approach theorizing returns uh, returns us to the apparently perennial question for scholars of disability and education. How to defend inclusive education and indeed, how to avoid the kinds of seg segregation patterns that have historically followed from the view that full inclusion detracts from the education of so-called normal or talented children. Now let us proceed to the normalcy and inclusion. One of the hallmarks of disability advocacy, disability rights, activism, and, and of the field of disability studies, studies more broadly is a sustained critique of normalcy. Disability studies scholar Rosemary Garland Thompson writes that these bodies deemed inferior because spectacles of others while the unmarked are shelt sheltered in the neutral space of normalcy. Far too often, schools measure students' level of achievement or potential achievements based on a norm, whether it is through standardized assessments peer comparisons, developmental theory, or even informal decisions based on a child's behavior. While normalcy is embedded in schooling practices, disability theorists have long argued that this embodiment is far from inevitable. 
While the capability approach is celebrated as normalizing a view of human diversity, even in relation to bodily limitations and impl impairments, the view nevertheless faces criticism as reinforcing normalcy. As I have discussed, both Nuss Nussbaum and Terzi argued that in educational context, it is frequently functioning well beings and doings rather than capabilities freedoms that schools should seek to equalize. This is because the functionings that children acquire through schooling enable future opportunities. Two further problems arise. One related to normalcy and the other related to construction of ch childhood versus adulthood. When are some functionings being promoted because they, they correspond to views about what is normal or developmentally appropriate rather than what is most beneficial for the child? Education takes place within social and cultural contexts that have their own specific sets of norms regarding what is required for effective participation in political and social activities. Certain functionings are quite likely to be involved, to be valued as they present are over others. For example, oral language is valued over sign language and children are encouraged to develop the skills of oral language through auditory aids and lip reading. A second worry concerning the promotion of normalcy has to do with the view of adulthood and childhood conceptualized through a capability approach. While capability approach emphasizes choice and the freedom to pursue the functionings one has reason to value, in the case of children, it is certain changes functioning that are promoted rather than choice. As I have said, this is because children require certain functionings in addition perhaps to a certain level of maturity gleaned through experience to allow them to develop capability later in life. But children do value their own freedom and their freedom to choose and that is, in many ways, a central part of their experience of moving up. Gaining more and more freedom ideally to pursue those things they value. Some children will value music and art over social and political knowledge. Some will value athletics over knowledge of the natural world. Of course, we desire to encourage children to pursue many different values and often they do. The case of individuals understood as having significant intellectual disabilities raises important further questions surrounding the distinction among <clears throat> childhood and adulthood that is implied within capability approach um, application to educational context. Carolyn Bailey's in 2002, for example, has critiqued Nussbaum's view of individuals with significant cognitive disabilities as relying on a view of human normalcy that promotes particular competencies and functionings as being necessary for a properly human life. According to Bailey's, Nussbaum's thereby risks setting a problematic standard of normalcy. Norms or baselines can be too easily and negligently constructed to exclude individuals on the basis of limitations or presumed deviations of physical or mental functionings. Concerns over social norms and the role of choice are also pertinent to the problem of educational efficiency. When will it be more educationally practical and effective to correct or normalize things in the child to insist upon the use of hearing aids, for example? than to support their design functionings. Indeed, there is research that indicates that the instances in normative educational functionings to exclusive or alternate, alternative ones can actually impede child's academic growth.